Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions. And the first question is from Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to increase support for people with Crohn's disease or colitis. Minister Aileen Campbell. Thank you. Uh, we are pleased to have supported and funded <laughs> Crohn's and Colitis UK in the production of Scotland Leading the Way, a national blueprint for inflammatory bowel disease in Scotland, which seeks support uh, NHS uh, boards to, uh, in improving care and treatment for people living with inflammatory bowel disease in Scotland. The main aim of the blueprint document is to suggest improvements across a wide range of areas, including diagnosis at primary care level, improving patient access to advice and information, provision of specialist services, for example, clinics, paediatricians, dietitians, and psychological support and IT strategies. Scotland is the only UK country doing this kind of work on behalf of this group of patients. Polly McNeill. I thank the Minister for that detailed answer. Um, she will be aware that for some reason that there's a higher prevalence of Crohn's and colitis in Scotland than in the rest of the UK, and children in particular are sufferers. An estimated 26,000 sufferers in Scotland who are benefiting from the work that she describes. Would the Minister endorse, firstly, the work of the Catherine McEwen uh, Foundation in Scotland? And secondly, would the Minister be open to a meeting with me to discuss how we can look at increasing the number of uh, IBD nurses in Scotland, but also to refine those services to ensure that they meet the individual needs of patients and sufferers? Minister. Um, thank you. Uh, I thank uh, Polly McNeill for the, the a supplementary question. Of course, I would uh, be delighted to undertake a meeting with uh, the member and also to uh, learn more about the Catherine McEwen Foundation uh, as well and the work that I'm sure, uh, the good work that's undertaken by that foundation. Uh, and also very interested to learn what more we can do to help particularly uh, young uh, children and young adults with this condition. And just would like to uh, raise awareness across the chamber of one young girl who spoke in the parliament yesterday, Grace Warnock, who has been instrumental in changing the disabled toilet signs here in the parliament with the help of uh, Ian Gray, um, who spoke very movingly about her work and uh, the work that she's doing to ensure that people have a greater understanding of visible, uh, condi uh, invisible conditions that require access to disabled toilets. Linda Fabiani. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, could I ask the Minister, um, uh, further to what she's saying about Grace Warnock, whether she's aware of Miss Jenny Cook, a young girl from East Kilbride, who, with the support of her family, and of course, uh, Derek McEwen of the Kathleen McEwen Foundation has now raised more than £285,000 for the Kathleen McEwen Foundation and the Children's Hospital Charity, formerly York Hill in Glasgow. Does she recognise that many, many children uh, fundraise for others with conditions that they have suffered themselves and work tirelessly for this? And would she join, in, join me in wishing Miss Jenny Cook all the best as she heads towards the £300,000 mark at the age of 13. Minister. Um, yeah. Absolutely, um, and I think like the whole of the Chamber United here to uh, congratulate Jenny on that fantastic work. And I'm aware of the outstanding fundraising work carried out by Jenny Cook to help and improve the lives of fellow sufferers of ulcerative uh, colitis. And in my previous role as Minister for Children and Young People, I'm well aware of the, the enormous amount of effort that our young people do, our fantastic young people do, to put back into society if they have needed help themselves uh, and to make sure that others can uh, benefit from their knowledge, their expertise, and of course their fundraising endeavours and I think it's absolutely fantastic that Jenny uh, has subsequently received the award of Young Scot of the Year in 2016. Well-deserved recognition for the selfless work that Jenny has made to the lives of others. Donald Cameron. Um, <clears throat> whilst the introduction of the national blueprint for IBD and the emphasis on increasing support for people with Crohn's or colitis is highly welcome, can the Scottish Government update the Parliament on what it is doing to deal with the dramatic rise in the numbers of children being diagnosed with IBD in Scotland? Minister. We continue to work hard to ensure that young people and uh, anyone who has and suffers from the, these conditions are given the help and the support that they are needed. And of course, we have continued to work with Crohn's and Colitis UK uh, 
and the Delivering Outpatient Integration Together programme, a, a multi-stakeholder working group which includes patients, clinicians, specialists, nurses and dietitians who are developing pathways regarding the treatment and care of patients with IBD across Scotland. Uh, and of course, uh, the member pointed to the blueprint <coughs> as well. But it's always issue, an area that we need to uh, continue to be vigilant on and of course take on board anybody else's views <coughs> and, and opinions. But certainly this is something that we have great make great strides on. I mentioned in my response to uh, Polly McNeill that some of the work I outlined in her response is uh, in Scotland we are the only country in the UK doing this kind of work on behalf of this group of patients. So I think we'll continue to make the progress that we need, continue to work with patients, continue to work with young people as well, particularly the ones that are doing so much to ensure that others uh, don't have to unnecessarily suffer and continue to make sure that we're making the improvements we need to this, uh, these services. Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government when the estimated completion date is for the new East Lothian Community Hospital. Oh, sorry, sorry, Ms. Allerton. Sorry, I, I thought you were pressing your button as a supplementary. I've got you down for question no. number ten no. later. No. That's okay. My my mistake. Uh, question number two, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the new East Lothian Community Hospital project. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Uh, well, I'm delighted to announce that financial close was reached for this contract on the 23rd of September and that construction will start in a few weeks on this £70 million project. The new hospital will be a significant addition to the local healthcare facilities available in East Lothian, bringing services back to the area and helping more patients get treatment closer to home. I look forward to work getting underway and seeing this fantastic new facility become a reality. Ian Green. Well, it is great news that construction is about to begin on the new hospital in Harrington, given that it should have started almost 10 years ago and should have been completed uh, seven years ago. Uh, as a Harrington resident, though, I have to tell the Cabinet Secretary that local joy is tempered by the fact that day surgery under general anaesthetic currently carried out in Harrington has been cut from the new hospital before a brick is laid. Some 2,000 patients a year will not get surgery locally, and clinicians tell me there is nowhere in Lothian for them to go, except presumably uh, onto an ever-lengthening waiting list. Even at this late stage, will the Cabinet Secretary intervene, make this £70 million project a £71 million project, and retain day surgery in Haddington? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm glad that Ian Gray uh, welcomed the good news because good news it is um, for uh, the people of uh, East uh, Lothian. He uh, talked about the issue of surgical services. As he is aware, uh, there has been a lot of work done by the group that was established to look at NHS Lothian's use of the facility and the services that should be provided uh, in, in the new hospital. Um, it has clearly been um, a long discussion based on clinical uh, decision making about what should be provided within the new hospital. Uh, it will provide a range of primary care and outpatient services, step down care, mental health services and care of the elderly accommodation. Uh, I would hope that uh, Ian Gray would welcome the fact that this £70 million investment will deliver an improvement in patient care for his constituents and, of course, very happy to continue to discuss with Ian Gray the development of the hospital. Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Health and Sport Committee, I do welcome the news that the work will soon be underway at the new East Lothian Community Hospital project. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the services returning to East Lothian will result in an increase in the number of people being treated closer to home and result in an overall improvement in the quality of care of patients? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, it's very important, it's the delivery of the national clinical strategy that more people are treated as close to home as possible. Uh, this new hospital uh, will help to deliver that. Uh, as I said earlier, it is a fantastic uh, project, £70 million worth of investment. Uh, and I think that should be something that members across this chamber would welcome, including Ian Gray. Question number three, Edward Mountain. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce waiting times for urology and orthopaedics in NHS Highland. Cabinet Secretary. 
The Scottish Government continues to support all boards, including NHS Highland, to ensure patients get swift access to the hospital care they need. In 2016-17, we've increased NHS Highland's resource budget by 5% to £577.5 million, an above inflation increase. In addition, at the end of August, I announced that a further £2 million will be made available to the NHS, specifically to address long waits for outpatient consultations. This money will be allocated to boards shortly, and it's expected that NHS Highland will focus the additional funding they get to address long waits in orthopaedics and neurology. The Scottish Government has also uh, announced the commitment to invest £200 million to create five new elective centres, including one in Inverness. And these will help to ensure that procedures like hip and knee surgery uh, can be uh, carried out more quickly. And uh, I think that is hopefully something that the member will welcome. Edward Round. Um, what I welcome is, is plans to address the problem. At the moment, the 18-week target time from seeing a surgeon to getting an operation is within the Highlands, in most cases met within the tolerances that are allowed. But that hides the real problem. The real problem is the time it takes to get from a referral from your doctor to see the surgeon. So for example, in orthopaedics, you have a 48 week delay from the moment you're referred from your doctor to do see a surgeon. And in urology, you've got a 60 week delay from the moment you see your doctor to see when you see the surgeon. So in the case of somebody looking for a urology operation, it's closer to a two-year wait than a one-year wait for the person to get that operation from the moment it's identified by the doctor. So I'd ask the minister again, is the extra money that is being allowed going to be sufficient to bring the Highlands into line with the rest of Scotland and get these del delays down from the unacceptable period they are at the moment? Uh, well, can I say the member raises some very important uh, questions here and the issue of um, the urology service within NHS Highland has been a, a, a very important uh, subject of discussion between uh, my officials and NHS Highland. Uh, it is very, very important that improvements are made. The board's local delivery plan highlights urology services as a main area of concern and in particular prostate surgery. Um, um, a recent uh, agreement with NHS Grampian will see NHS Highland patients assessed in Inverness and operated on in Aberdeen and this will increase capacity on both sites for this complex surgery. Uh, further work is required to develop regional and national solutions to the provision of additional capacity. I've mentioned the elective centres but meanwhile, uh, the share that NHS Highland will get of that additional money, uh, they have said very clearly, is going to uh, be focused on the long waits in orthopaedics and neurology. I'm very happy to keep the member updated of developments as, as they go forward. Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what specific measures the Scottish Government has employed to recruit more doctors to rural areas like NHS Highland, which would reduce waiting times? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, uh, the future of general practice is very, very important and is at the heart of our NHS. Uh, we have, of course, increased the number of GPs uh, by over 7%, but we recognise very much that in some parts of the country there are significant challenges in recruitment and, of course, we've taken a number of measures to attract GPs to rural and remote areas. We've increased the number of GP recruitment places this year from uh, 300 to 400. We've created the uh, Scottish Targeted Bursary Scheme. And uh, we have looked at uh, a number of other initiatives, including a £2 million package to help uh, the number of GP recruitment and retention uh, projects, such as the Scottish Rural Medicine Collaborative uh, and others. I'm very happy to uh, write to Kate Forbes with more detail of that. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm quite interested in the orthopaedic service question in Highland. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be familiar that a decision was taken to remove trauma and orthopaedic services from Monklands Hospital in the central Scotland region I represent. The Scottish Parliament has made clear that the Government must call this decision in. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether she will respect the will of the Parliament and if she will make an urgent statement to Parliament on this serious matter? That's, that's not a supplementary on the question that's on the order paper. Uh, Marie Todd. 
To ask the Scottish Government what steps have been taken to improve A&E performance in NHS Highland in recent times and what A&E performance currently is in the Health Board area. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, A&E performance uh, has um, improved within uh, uh, the, the Highlands. At uh, the last um, figures, I think, were around uh, 95%. 95.5% for Keith Ness. Uh, Ragmore had 93.7%. Um, and uh, Lorne and Islands, I think, was 100%. So uh, there has certainly been an improvement in the performance of the Highland uh, hospitals on their a &E targets, but there's always more room for improvement. And that's why we will be uh, developing and working with boards through their winter plans, um, which will include making sure that other measures that they can take to ensure that during the winter period, a &E performance uh, is maintained. Uh, we will help to take them forward. Question number four, Christina McAlvey. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will next meet NHS Lanarkshire. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, ministers and officials regularly meet with representatives of, of all boards, including NHS Lanarkshire, to discuss matters of importance to local people. Christina McCarthy. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary that when she does get the opportunity to next meet with NHS Lanarkshire, that she raises with them the evidence sourced from the Thai campaign that shows that 95% of young LGBTI respondents reported that being bullied at school impacted upon their mental health. This is in conjunction with 58% of LGBTI respondents admitting self-harm as a result of bullying, with 45% doing so on a regular basis. Therefore, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that by adopting an inclusive educational approach advocated by the Thai campaign, that this will go a long way to reinforcing the Scottish Government's progressive mental health strategy, not only for young people in Hamilton, Larkhall and Stonehouse, but for young people across the whole of Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I uh, agree with uh, Christina McKelvey that bullying of any kind is unacceptable and must be addressed? We know that children and young people's well-being and attainment can be severely impacted by bullying. And we want all schools to promote an inclusive approach to relationships, sexual health and parenthood education. And that's why anti-bullying policies should be at the heart of a whole school approach by creating a positive and welcoming ethos and why health and well-being sits alongside literacy and numeracy as the responsibility of all staff. Very happy again if Christina McKelvey wants uh, more detail of some of the, the programmes that we're supporting. Happy to write to her with that. Anasawa. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary has had time to think about the answer to this question, which relates to Monklands Hospital. Uh, the reality is that there was no consultation process for the closure of orthopaedics at Monklands Hospital. And as my colleagues already stated, the will of Parliament was clear last week. There was a clear majority in this Parliament to have that change called in for a ministerial decision. Will the Health Secretary make an urgent statement to this Parliament to say that she will call those decisions in, Monklands and the others, and that she will reject them? Uh, well, of course, it was the presiding officer that decided who should answer the question or whether the question was to be answered. I'm sure you'll respect the will of the, the presiding officer. But in answer to your question, as I said um, previously in this chamber, NHS Lanarkshire's interim plans are about ensuring clinical safety and quality of care, as supported by clinical experts at the Academy of Royal Colleges and Faculties, who um, I'm sure Anna Sarwar would not want to doubt the importance of what they have to say about clinical safety and the quality of care, given his own clinical background. It will also help to address issues around the recruitment, retention and the training of key clinical staff, as highlighted in reports from Healthcare Improvement Scotland and the Postgraduate Dean for Medical Education. As Anna Sarwar and others are aware, their longer term service plans are currently the subject of formal public consultation, which will run until the 1st of November. Again, I would encourage all local stakeholders to play a full part in this. Uh, as I said 
early and as the First Minister has also said, it's important to stress that no decisions have been taken on any of these proposed service changes. So at the moment there is nothing in front of me to say anything about. But before any decisions are made, the proposals have to go through what is a well-established process, which includes the engagement and consultation of local people, something I would hope Anna Sarwa would support. But following the conclusion of that process, I will then be in a position at that point to make a judgment and of course I will take last week's debate and decision very much into account and will report back to Parliament as the First Minister has already confirmed. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary may know, the decision on orthopaedic trauma has been taken. It will come into effect at the end of this month without any consultation. And I wonder if perhaps you could explain to Parliament and constituents if the service is unsafe, how come it has become unsafe under her watch over the last 10 years of this government? Cabinet Secretary. As uh, Elaine Smith knows, there has been significant investment into Monklands Hospital over recent years, something that she consistently fails to recognise in this parliament. I think that does a great disservice to the staff in Monklands Hospital and indeed the patients who use it. But I have said time and time again to Elaine Smith, and she understands well and good that the proposals that have been uh, approved and are going forward by NHS Lanarkshire are interim plans based around the clinical safety and the recommendations are supported by the Academy of Royal Colleges and Faculties. Now, if politicians in this place think they know better than uh, the clinicians who raise clinical safety, then I think they should think long and hard about whether they have the uh, expertise that puts them in a position more than the clinicians who are making these recommendations. As she also knows well, the longer term plans uh, beyond the interim plan are the subject of formal public consultation and will uh, indeed uh, come to me uh, at the end of the day. So I would encourage Elaine Smith and others uh, to play a full part in that consultation that runs until the 1st of November. Question number five, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to reduce waiting times for initial hospital appointments following GP referrals in NHS Ayrshire and Arran. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government continues to support all boards, including NHS Ayrshire and Arran, to ensure patients get swift access to the hospital care they need. In 2016-17, we have increased NHS Ayrshire and Arran's resource budget by 5.3%, to £669 million, an above inflation increase. In addition, at the end of August, I announced that a further £2 million would be made available to the NHS, uh, and the money will be allocated shortly to NHS boards, including NHS Ayrshire and Arran. John Scott. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary will be aware of a lack of physiotherapy services and extended waiting times for areas of surgery such as orthopaedics in NHS Ayrshire and Arran, as well as the problems encountered last winter when surgical beds were used for medical patients resulting in extended waiting times for planned surgery. Notwithstanding her answer, for which I thank her, can she reassure my constituents and the people of Ayrshire that waiting times will reduce in future and that plans are in place to deal with the expected increase in demand for hospital beds over the approaching winter period? The Cabinet Secretary. Scott again raises some very important issues. He will be aware that there is a, a, a very um, clear process of developing winter plans. Uh, those are scrutinised very carefully by officials to make sure that they are robust. Uh, I will make sure that in looking at Ayrshire and Arran's winter plan, that the issues that, you, that John Scott raises, particularly in relation to physiotherapy and the issue of uh, waiting times, uh, is addressed. It is important that uh, boards going into the winter are in the best position that they can be in. Uh, and I can reassure John Scott that we will certainly uh, be uh, interrogating Ayrshire and Aaron's winter plans to make sure that we are satisfied that they will be able to deliver a, a safe and a good quality service through the winter. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Cabinet Secretary how the NHS Ayrshire and Arran budget compares to when this government took office. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, NHS Ayrshire and Arran's resource budget has increased by 172.1 million, or 34.6%, since 2006 7 
That's a real terms increase of 65.1 million or 11 per cent. Um, and what I would add to Emma Harper is that, of course, um, demand and has also increased and the pressure on uh, services has also increased. So it is important that as new resources um, flow in to the NHS, that we also have to change the way services are delivered to ensure that that quality uh, continues. And that is something that we will do through the National Clinical Strategy. Question number six, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve working conditions for social care staff. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, terms and conditions of employment are, of course, matters for individual employers. However, the Scottish Government expects all employers to adopt fair working practices. The Scottish Government has taken action in a number of ways to address fair work practices through the measures in statutory guidance on procurement, through the fair work framework and by encouraging fair work more generally through the promotion of the Scottish Business Pledge. The Scottish Government is providing significant investment to enable local authorities to commission care services that pay adult care workers, including in the independent and third sector, the full living wage of £8.25 per hour from October the 1st of this year. The codes of practice for employers published by the Scottish Social Services Council set out employers' responsibilities for supporting their workforce to achieve the standards of practice and behaviour required of them. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. The Scottish Greens fully support the provision of the real living wage in the care sector and throughout our economy, uh, and we, we certainly support the government's efforts in that regard. Turnover in this sector is relatively high, and we know that a great many employers in the sector are actively recruiting in other EU countries. What impact does the Cabinet Secretary think will be experienced on people's working conditions if employers are required by the UK government to begin listing foreign workers in an effort to stigmatise and shame them? And can the Cabinet Secretary say what impact will be felt on those already working in the sector if employers find it more difficult to recruit overseas workers who are so vital in our care services as a result of this blatantly racist policy? Cabinet Secretary. Can I say to Patrick Harvey, he raises some very, very important matters. Uh, can I first of all welcome his support for the living wage and, and his comments uh, about that? He is right to identify retention and turnover uh, as an issue within the, the care sector. That is why, of course, the living wage is so important because it is part of the solution to encourage people to come into the care sector, but also to remain working in the care sector. Uh, it is without doubt the, the case that within the care sector, particularly within care homes, there is a, a large percentage relatively of those uh, from uh, the EU working within our care sector, particularly within care homes. I've asked the SSSC to do some work on actually getting more and better data around how many people are uh, from within the EU uh, working within the care sector. But if we were to lose <coughs> that cohort of people working here, it would uh, create a significant gap for our care services. So it's very, very important that we send out a message that they are welcome here, welcome to work here. And I would want the UK government uh, to take a position of ensuring that those who are working and living here and contributing to the Scottish economy can remain doing so. I agree with Patrick Harvey that the idea of businesses listing foreign workers is absolutely abhorrent. It is a, 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 a terrible, terrible uh, thing for any minister uh, to say. I think it creates division. I think it creates um, the type of society that is not something we would want here in Scotland. So I think it's important that we unite across this chamber to send out a message that is not something we think um, is a, a right and proper thing to do. It's something we reject and that we welcome those from the rest of the EU working within our health and care sectors. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, on the 27th of September, the, the Scottish Government wrote to integrate a joint board chief officers regarding the living wage for social care workers. The letter told them that IGBs did not need to pay the living wage to workers carrying out sleepover shifts. 
Will the Cabinet Secretary apologise to those workers for failing to deliver the living wage for them on the 1st of October as promised by the Scottish Government? And will she tell members today just exactly when those workers can expect to be paid the living wage? Cabinet Secretary. I think it's quite sad that Colin Smith, rather than welcoming the fact that nearly 40,000 care staff, many of them women, are from the 1st of October going to get a pay rise. Is that not something the Labour benches could bring themselves to welcome. I think it's very sad that you can't do that. And on the issue of sleepovers, let me just quote what um, Dave Watson from Unison has said. He says, with sleepovers, we want everybody to be paid the living wage, but we accept it does require a bit more work. So if Unison can be constructive about this, representing their workers, why can't the Labour Party? Absolutely. Question number seven, Claire Hockey. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making to ensure that NHS staff receive at least the living wage. Cabinet Secretary. The requirement to pay the Scottish living wage in the NHS was introduced in 2011 and the lowest available pay point has been at or above the Scottish living wage rate ever since. In addition, the Scottish Government has provided significant investment to support the payment of the Scottish living wage to adult social care workers from the 1st of October this year and has been working closely with health and social care partnerships and providers to make delivery of this policy successful. Clear hockey. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for that answer. Um, with NHS Scotland staff guaranteed the real living wage, how much better off is someone entering the lowest point in Agenda for Change Band 1 in Scotland compared to NHS England per year? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I can uh, tell uh, Claire Hockey that someone um, entering the lowest pay point currently available in NHS Scotland would be £881 per year better off than their English counterpart. I think that is a, a good sign of the partnership working that we have with the unions and the fact that we have, of course, accepted the pay recommendations from the independent pay review bodies, unlike other parts uh, of these islands. Uh, we uh, believe very strongly that the partnership working uh, with uh, the unions is, is a very important aspect of ensuring that we deliver progress for staff working within our NHS. Question number eight, Jackson Carlo. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the assurances that it has received from Boston Scientific regarding the possible use of counterfeit material in surgical mesh. Cabinet Secretary. The MHRA regulates medical devices across the UK and has not issued a, a medical device alert regarding the implants concerned. The MHRA has found no evidence to indicate that uh, uh, that mesh implants are unsafe and has not found it necessary to initiate any enforcement action against Boston Scientific or any other manufacturer in the UK. Should that situation change, uh, we would expect appropriate action to be taken by MHRA. The Scottish Government's request to suspend these procedures uh, is due to an independent review of the use of mesh products brought about by wider concerns about their use. It's not related to the allegations of counterfeit material. Jackson Carlo. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that? I have here the letter she wrote to my constituent Elaine Holmes and to Olive McElroy, two uh, uh, mesh uh, survivors living with the appalling consequences, uh, unforeseen consequences of mesh implants. And I understand what she says about the uh, MHRA, but given the lamentable performance by the MHRA to the Public Petitions Committee in the last session, where it's transpired that their examination of these issues had been a £20,000 desk doc study by three people over two weeks, is she really satisfied that a phone call by them to the company concerned who told them that there's nothing to worry about is an adequate examination of the suitability of this material or the seriousness of the, of, of the consequences of this problem? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I, I mean, I have some sympathy with what Jackson Carlaw is saying, but you know, we can't get away from the fact that it is the MHRA's role to regulate the use of medical devices in the UK. And the fact is that as yet, they haven't issued a, an alert in relation to Boston Scientific's uh, products. But 
I am willing, if Jackson Carlow would find it helpful, to relay um, the concerns that he has expressed in this parliament. I did so at the after the committee session as well, because there was a, clearly a strength of feeling about the MHRA's role and the, the process that they had uh, gone through. So I'm very happy again to relay uh, those concerns uh, to MHRA. Neil Finlay. Uh, I find the Cabinet, Secretary, uh, Cabinet Secretary's attitude complacent uh, in this. Uh, this is a very, very serious issue, very serious issue. Will the Cabinet Secretary join me in calling on the Crown Office to investigate these very serious allegations of, against Boston Scientific of using counterfeit materials, which potentially could be implanted in women in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, I'm sorry that Neil Finlay uh, feels that way about my answer, but I do not regulate the use of medical devices in the UK. That is the responsibility of the MHRA. Therefore, all I can do is to make the, the, the views of Parliament, of yourself, Neil Finlay, and of Jackson Carlaw, clear to the MHRA. It is obviously up to the Crown Office if they believe there are any issues uh, relating to this that are for them to look at and that is something the, the Crown Office I'm sure will respond to Neil Finlay about but you know the, the fact of the matter is that it is the MHRA's role to regulate the use of medical devices in the UK not the Scottish Government's role. Question number nine Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made with the construction of the new District General Hospital for Dumfries and Galloway. Cabinet Secretary. Excellent progress is being made. A couple of weeks ago, the topping out ceremony took place at the new hospital, signifying the building has reached the highest point in its construction and marking an exciting milestone for all those involved in the project. It's a uh, um, a, a very exciting time for, um, for the new hospital project as it moves them one step closer to seeing their vision for a fantastic new facility for patients and staff become a reality. I also add that the new hospital project has delivered significant community benefits in terms of new jobs, apprenticeships and training opportunities and uh, will continue to maximise these gains over the coming year. Emma Harper. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that single bed occupancy rooms like, like those which will be in the new hospital are important for patient welfare and meeting the current infection control standards? Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is committed to providing patients with the best possible standard of patient care and single rooms help to provide a, a better and safer environment for our patients. In view of the potential benefits to patient safety and experience, it's been our policy since 2010 that for all new build hospitals and other healthcare facilities which provide inpatient accommodation, there should be a presumption that all patients will be accommodated in single rooms unless there are clinical reasons for multi-bedded rooms to be available. Question number 10, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government when the estimated completion date is for the new East Lothian Community Hospital. Cabinet Secretary. The highly anticipated facility which is being developed jointly by NHS Lothian and East Lothian Health and Social Care Partnership will provide a fit for purpose facility to deliver high quality health care for the county and it's expected that it will be open to patients in 2019. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As the Cabinet Secretary will know, services have been relocated away from Rudelands Hospital as the new hospital is built. How will disruption to patients from East Lothian be kept to a minimum as the new build takes place? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, we would expect um, the, 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 that to happen and to ensure that uh, any disruption is kept to uh, a minimum. Um, inevitably, with uh, projects of this scale, there will be some, but I think it's important that the continuity of care and patient care is, uh, is there, and indeed the disruption to local residents is kept to a minimum. Uh, if uh, Rachel Hamilton would like, I'm very happy to uh, make sure she's provided with some further detail on how, in practical terms, that will be done. Question number 11, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it is having with universities to encourage the study of medicine and general practice. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we continue to work with Scotland's five medical schools to 
ensure that we have a sustainable workforce for NHS Scotland. This includes working closely with universities to deliver our medical education package, which will increase supply and widen access. Through this package, we're investing £23 million in increasing medical undergraduate places by 50 from 2016-17 and in establishing Scotland's first graduate medical entry programme and a pre-medical entry programme. Richard Lang. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Recently, my constituent Daniel met with me distressed as he was not accepted for medicine due to grades which he received despite the personal circumstances which he faced during the academic year. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary what support is given to ensure young people are supported in their ambitions to study medicine and general practice? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I understand that we have the, the details of the case that uh, Richard Lyle is referring to, and uh, officials will reply uh, to him directly on that. Um, just on a wider point, the Scottish Government and Scottish Funding Council are taking specific actions in order to widen access to medicine for people from the widest range of backgrounds in Scotland. The Scottish Funding Council also supports the REACH programme, the purpose of which is to increase the proportion of pupils from the lowest 40% deprived postcodes and underrepresented schools into higher education. The focus of REACH is in the high demand subject areas, including medicine, the SFC has also developed a series of outcomes with all universities against which progress and widening access can be measured. The 50 extra undergraduate places which I've already mentioned will be focused on widening, widening access criteria. Can I thank members? That concludes topical questions. Yes, sorry, point of order, Douglas Ross. Officer, and I apologise for not giving advance notice of this, but as question number 12 in today's um, health questions, can I ask if you will reflect on the number of questions selected and the number of supplementaries taken? Given that we have 40 minutes for questions today and 20 members were asked to submit questions which, like me, were to raise important constituency cases, uh, for example, people in Elgin who have significant concerns about the eye care at Dr Gray's, should we perhaps be selecting less questions and ensuring we get through all the ones on the order paper or taking less supplementaries to ensure all the important issues are raised and debated in the Chamber? Thank Mr Ross for raising the point. I'm not sure it's a point of order, but I can assure him that these matters are actually under active consideration. We are considering, for example, reducing the number of questions selected. I'm conscious that members are... Uh, question number 20, for example, we'll be sitting in the chamber without any realistic chance of ever getting to number 20. So we're looking at the possibility of reducing the number of questions being submitted. On the number of supplementaries, I'm anxious to take people who, who ask supplementaries. There are a number of people who pressed their button today, including a number of Mr Ross's colleagues, who I wasn't able to take. Sometimes that's due to the length of the replies from the minister, but sometimes that's because they require a lengthy answer. Uh, so these are difficult matters, but they are under consideration. I would hope the member will accept that. We now move to a ministerial statement. I would ask uh, for a few minutes while we change seats and the minister is ready.